Hello, good evening. Welcome everyone to the National Humanities Center Humanities in Class webinar series. Tonight's session is titled Medieval Chivalry, the Crusades and the Modern Far Right. The National Humanities Center is located in Durham, North Carolina, and for the last 43 years we have uh, supported and tried to enhance the best in humanity scholarship. Uh, the center is a place in which university professors come and do their work in fellowship, they conduct their research, they write their books, and then our education department is intended to uh, extend that work and create bridges between classrooms at all levels and the center and the scholarship that it represents. So many of our uh, activities like tonight's webinar are online and virtual. Uh, as you can see from the chat box at the bottom of your go to training control panel, we have participants and teachers and educators from all over the country. It's always good to see so many of you from so many nooks and crannies of uh, the United States. Um, some of your names are very, very familiar. People like Jamie Gellner, who spent some time at the center uh, from Charlottesville this past summer, and Christine Esposito, who's just down the road in the other part of the city. Um, I'm also really pleased to see people like Tammy Sweeney in Pennsylvania or Sandra Cord in Wisconsin. And you start to see the way that these communities build across the country, and I hope that they extend beyond the, uh, the length of this 90-minute webinar. That's really, I think, what the center is intended to be, a, a sort of space, um, both literal and figurative, in which humanities scholars and humanities educators can uh, begin to think through the complicated notion of, of educating uh, the youth um, and, and others using the humanities as that key. My name is Andy Mink, and I'm the Vice President for Education at the Center. If at any point during tonight's session you can't hear my voice, um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to turn the baton right back to you, and that means that it's almost always going to be on your end. And so I would encourage you to um, play with your earbuds, maybe adjust your volume. At the very least, you can log out and back in, and that seems to sort of kickstart things. I wish technology wasn't always that sort of voodoo, but it does seem like the restart, the reboot, seems to make all the difference in the world. So at any point tonight, if you lose volume or if something's crackling or voices are fading in and out, uh, you can certainly type something into the chat box. And if a lot, if it's happening to a lot of people, then we can troubleshoot, but it's almost, uh, almost uh, certainly on your end. So please uh, give that a, a check. I always wanna acknowledge my education team at the center, Libby Taylor, who many of you communicate with uh, for the webinars and for the various things that you register for is the education programs coordinator and Mike Williams, who oversees our online courses and uh, participates in our face-to-face -face trainings is the Education pro uh, Programs Manager. All three of us are available anytime if you have questions or thoughts or suggestions about ways that we can better work with you, either individually, with your school, with your district, with your state, or with your discipline. A couple of reminders I'd like to, uh, to give you tonight, and that starts with um, the fact that you are gonna be muted. Uh, my friend Katerina Nemakova from California, who participated in a graduate student training this past summer, you know, was chatting in the chat box and, and sort of uh, noted that she couldn't turn her microphone on, and that's actually going to be the case. You um, will only hear my voice and Professor Whitaker's voice, but you do have a very active role to play in tonight's session, and that's through that chat box. So please uh, register questions. Um, make comments, uh, exclaim if you like, um, you know, talk to each other, talk to us. And my job as the moderator is to bring your clarifying questions and anything you'd like for CORD to extend into this conversation. So I'm gonna keep my eye on that chat box and please feel free to type in uh, at will and at liberty and we'll try to incorporate your curiosities in tonight, into tonight's session. I'd also include you, uh, encourage you to download our pre-approval form which will help you um, organize and submit the documentation for each of the webinars that you spend with us this year. Oftentimes, school administrators uh, would much prefer just to get a bundle of these all checked off and perhaps even uh, approved in advance. And I would encourage you to, uh, to do that. And as you complete each session, you can download that certificate then and, and add it to the, uh, to the bundle. I'm also very pleased that tonight's session is co-branded and co-sponsored by our friends and colleagues at the Medieval Academy of America. Uh, the MAA was founded in 1925 and still sits as the largest organization in the United States uh, in support of the field of medieval studies. Uh, although history is my background, I have to admit that you know I'm always just, um, I'm surprised and a, a little bit shocked and I'm always really pleased to see the deep professional network between all humanities fields and disciplines. 
And uh, I think you'll find tonight that oftentimes these fields that, you know, for, for some people, particularly students, feel like a long time ago and a far place away, really have some very critical uh, contemporary lenses that we can offer um, to our classes and to our curriculum. So I would encourage you to check out the Medieval Academy of America. Uh, there's a link at the bottom of the screen. They also have an annual conference, uh, as well as uh, a variety of prizes, grants, and publications that you can take advantage of. A couple of other quick announcements about our webinar uh, series. Uh, Libby and Mike and I have really tried hard to, um, to figure out ways to make more seats available in our webinars. Uh, we opened them on August 15th this year, and within just a day or two, they were essentially sold out and all the seats were taken. And I understand the impulse. If it were me and it were middle of August, I would go through and see all these wonderful topics and wonderful speakers and just click a lot, of, uh, just sign up for as many as I could. And then, of course, life happens. And, you know, the, the month rolls around. It's September. It's uh, March. It's April. And something comes up. Your child is in soccer. You're busy, whatever, and you can't make it. Um, what we've encouraged people to do is to release that seat if you're busy and you know you can't make it. And so, of course, what happens is that these seats start to emerge. They bubble up sometimes just two or three at a time. So what we're doing, what, what I will try to do during each webinar se uh, session is indicate of the upcoming sessions how many seats seem to be available. So at 6.30 p.m. tonight, we had the following uh, spaces available. Uh, next week with Jason Sokol, uh, the webinar titled There Goes My Everything, White Southerners During the Civil Rights Era. Right now, there are two seats available. Uh, so go to our website, nationalhumanitycenter.org, and you can register, should be able to register. If the link says sold out, I think you can still click on it and get to the registration page. Um, we have 37 seats available for Patrick Ball's session on the marriage between mathematics and poetry. Uh, both Patrick and David's uh, session we released actually later in the school year, so I suspect a lot of folks came and signed up all at once and then just sort of forgot about it. So we do have a, uh, just a, a tad over 30 uh, seats left. Um, we also have one seat left with Natalie Russell from the Huntington Library. Uh, she'll be leading a session on the pioneering fiction of Octavia Butler, and then again about 20 seats uh, with David Chappelle from University of Oklahoma on, uh, on a, what I think is a very provocative question, can we understand modern acts of terrorism by, uh, by studying and understand the Jonestown massacre in the late 1970s? So at any point, feel free to uh, open up a window and go and sign up for the seats that are remaining. I also want to uh, note that we, this semester, will be incentivizing the attendance to our sessions by offering these two VIP sessions for any of you who attend 100% of the sessions you sign up for. So that might be one session, it might be 10 sessions, but if you if you show up for what you signed up for, then you'll get a special hidden link to attend one of these two or both of these sessions. Uh, the first is in January to celebrate the fall semester. We'll be talking with Mark Aronson and Maria Budos from uh, Rutgers and William Patterson University on the bar barbaric legacy of sugar. And it's uh, in particular, it's, um, it's representation in the 1619 project. And then at the end of the spring, way, way down at the end of April, we'll be working with Carolyn Denard from uh, Georgia State University on the life and writings of Toni Morrison. Lastly, I'd like to uh, remind you of other resources the center has available for you and your teaching. These include free instructional resources, lessons, primary source collections, podcasts, uh, webinar materials, scholarly essays. All of these are on our website and available for download and access really at any time. We also have an online course catalog that is uh, rapidly expanding. Our next course will be uh, starting on October the 28th. Registration opens on October 3rd, that's this coming Friday, and it's titled Oyster in the City, Environmental History at the Turn of the 20th Century. And that course will uh, do quite a bit of work with Library of Congress archival materials to really understand the central and critical role of the oyster as a primary actor in, uh, in early American history of the 20th century. So. Um, there are 40 slots available right now, and again, registration opens on uh, the October 3rd. Generally speaking, by the way, our courses are about five weeks long, and you can expect somewhere between five and six hours per week of work. And then finally, um, I'd like to announce, particularly because we have so many Los Angeles teachers with us, a two-day workshop that we'll be co-facilitating at the Huntington Museum in Pasadena. Uh, this will be in uh, the first weekend in March and really focus on a conversation between educators, archivists, and museum professionals. 
Uh, registration is not quite open, but I at least want to let you know that that's happening. You can put it on your calendar. And for all you folks in Southern California, Libby, Mike, and I will all be out there, and uh, we'd love to see you at this event. Our Teacher Advisory Council is an important part of what we do, and I always want to take the time to thank not just our current members, but previous members as well, folks like Jeff Wickersham, who uh, is from Michigan, Jamie Lathan, who's just down the street, and Martha Regalis's colleague at the North Carolina School of Science and Math, Michelle Kane, who I think is in the room tonight uh, representing uh, New Jersey, and uh, Camille Bernstein, who I think is also in the room, uh, who lives in Massachusetts. Um, each year we select a cohort of interdisciplinary and, and broad background, a variety of background educators who work with us in all kinds of ways to contribute and advise on our work. We really want to keep our work uh, relevant and meaningful for the classroom. I would encourage any of you, if you enjoy the work we do and you'd like to have a more active hand in an active role, to, uh, to look at the application process next spring. So that's my introduction of the center, uh, as I often do, and I hope um, uh, I hope that there are many opportunities that I share that you can consider being a part of. And uh, I'd also like to welcome Cord Whitaker to uh, to the room tonight. Uh, Cord's an associate professor in the Department of English and Creative Writing at Wesley College, and as I understand it, just blasted through the New Jersey uh, New, Jer New Jersey traffic not far from you, Michelle, uh, to get to uh, <laughs> join us tonight. Uh, Cord, are you with us? I am. Hi, exactly. Andy, and thank you so much for letting us know all the exciting things that are going on at the National Humanities Center. When we're finished tonight, I'll be going on myself and seeing how many of those seats I can snag up. <laughs> I'm happy to have you, and uh, <laughs> I'd love to see you at the center soon. Court, I'm going to turn the, uh, the, the mouse over to you in just a moment, but I, I always like to start with a little bit of an extemporaneous question. Um, and, and in some ways, I think it might set the tone for tonight. And, you know, really the purpose in some ways is for this audience, all of whom are educators, to consider ways that this, this complicated and, um, and maybe even uncomplicated content can be useful in their own teaching. And so I'd, I'd actually like to start before you move on with your PowerPoint and we get into the discussion by asking you, asking you this question, and that is, um, in, in your own work, both at Wesley and other places that uh, Wellesley and other places that you have taught or interacted or represented uh, the field, um, you know, late medieval English literature, um, Chaucer, uh, Beowulf, what, what would you say is the primary misconception that younger people have about this field and this discipline? Oh, my. Where, where, where do we get it wrong just by looking from the outside? Well, you know, you're really hitting at the heart of my entire research agenda and a lot of my writing um, and my teaching as well. People tend to think of the Middle Ages as an uncomplicated time, um, as an uncomplicated time that was innocent of a lot of our, uh, of a lot of our modern problems. Um, some of what uh, you, you all will hear from me tonight will have to do with ways that People think of the Middle Ages as the time when people knew their place and stayed in it. They think of the Middle Ages as a time when everyone, um, when everyone in a particular part of the world, say Europe, were, you know, looked the same, thought the same, and believed the same thing. Um, and many of my students come to, you know, come to my classrooms with those misconceptions about the period. Uh, and it's a dynamic that I call medieval innocence. So yeah, so that's so that's what I would say. Um, mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. is is one of the the biggest takeaways um, yeah. when you're thinking about how to teach the Middle Ages as well as teaching medievalism, which is you know the modern modern conceptions of and iterations of the Middle Ages, and that's a lot of what a lot of what we'll be talking about tonight. That, that's great, and it seems like um, you know what we struggle with, and maybe in all history, but certainly uh, medieval and ancient studies, is this notion that everything sort of was standing in repose, waiting for us to <laughs> waiting for us to remember it or discover it, and. What you're suggesting is that you know that world is just as complicated and, and human and flawed as anything else. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Well, fantastic. Thank you for asking that. I've I've given you the control of the screen now, Cord, and you can right. advance in the lower left-hand corner. And uh, 
Again, I'm going to be watching the chat box for any questions that our audience has, and I'll bring it to you. And right now, we're uh, we're looking forward to hearing from you. All right, thank you for thank you for that. Um, so, uh, thanks for the introduction, Andy. I am Cord Whitaker. I, I teach at Wellesley College. Um, I work very much at the intersection of medieval literature and the history of race. Um, right down here below uh, my information, you just see, you know, see a sample of the covers of, of books I've created. Um, that give you a sense of, of how I work in race and the Middle Ages together. Um, over here on the, you know, on the far right side, you see the cover to my 2015, um, my 2015 uh, special issue of the journal Post Medieval called Making Race Matter in the Middle Ages. The guy on the front of that cover um, is actually a Minnesota software engineer who spends some of his free time engaging in Society for Creative Anachronism um, events. Uh, and the SCA is a, a group only been in existence for the past couple decades, but they reenact medieval battles. And so one of the things that people found so striking about this image, of course, is here you have an African-American man, someone you know with, with Africanist features, um, portraying a medieval knight. And there's a certain disconnect that occurs there between the way we think of the medieval knight and his image. Uh, over on the left side of the screen, you have a very recent post-medieval issue I put out just a couple months ago that uh, speaks to my current work on the Harlem Renaissance and how Harlem Renaissance intellectuals often deployed the idea of the Middle Ages to stake an African-American claim to the entire history uh, and literary canon of the Anglophone West. Um, largely, they were saying the Middle Ages are ours too because we are writers and thinkers in English. The lady on the front there is a woman named Jessie Redmond Fawcett, who, um, who is often called, quote, the midwife of the Harlem Renaissance. In my opinion, she should be called its mother or its parent. Um, and uh, so that's a wonderful issue. Um, and then in the center here, we have my forthcoming book, Black Metaphors, How Modern Racism Emerged from Medieval Race Thinking. And I'm quite proud that that book is coming out from the University of Pennsylvania Press in three days. Um, and the book begins with begins by treating the Black Lives Matter movement, ends by treating the alt-right, and everything in the middle is about how the Middle Ages got us to where we are now. So that's a little bit about me. Um, and I think with that, maybe I'll launch right in to hearing a little bit from you. I can advance the screen here. Let's see, there we go. Uh, you'll see today, you heard that today is titled Medieval Chivalry, the Crusades and the Modern Far Right. Um, you may hear, we may not get too deeply into, you know, into the, the weeds of Crusades history tonight, um, but the Crusades inform much of what we'll be talking about in some, in some ways that are rather more implicit than explicit, and we can talk about that as we go along. One of the things I like to do when I'm teaching um, is to start off a new course by asking my students what the Middle Ages mean to them. This is often where I get a lot of the evidence for the claims I've made to you already that students tend to come to me thinking it was an uncomplicated time, uh, that it was a time of chivalry, where chivalry is a, a positive thing, uh, uh, where chivalry is, you know, the, the value of uh, valuing love, um, respecting, you know, very much respecting and, and giving honor to the object of one's desire, um, or simply fighting with honor. Fighting with great honor comes up quite a bit as well. But I'll tell you, uh, as another way of introducing myself, what the Middle Ages meant to me 
were perhaps a little different uh, before I started, you know, becoming a serious medievalist, before I started really studying the period. I can trace my own interest in the Middle Ages to a dream I had when I was five years old. And when I was five years old, um, I was, uh, I, I found myself in this dream in a very, very colorful world, brilliantly verdant green uh, grass, brilliantly blue sky with pink clouds in it. And I, five-year-old as I was, was dressed fully in medieval armor, shining, brilliant medieval armor. And then what should I see coming toward me but a brilliantly multicolored dragon? And that dragon chased me and then I mustered up all of this courage and I turned around and I chased that dragon. For me, from that point on, what the Middle Ages meant to me was uh, a bravery. It inspired in me a sense of bravery and boldness and courage to chase dragons, as it were. So, it means a lot more than that to me now, after some 20 years of deeply studying the history and literature of the period. Uh, but I always like to go back to that with my students and to also inspire them to think quite deeply about what the Middle Ages mean to them. So in the vein of doing that, it would be amazing if a couple people participating tonight would be so kind as to type in what the Middle Ages means to them. Um, and we can, Andy and I can sort of look at that and perhaps bring it up um, as we go along. Um, <clears throat> well, let's let's see what folks say. Alex Chrisman, uh, just down the road in uh, Raleigh, has already chimed in. Uh, fall back from Roman technology, engineering, loss or threatened loss of some positive aspects of civilization due to Mongols, mm -hmm. other invasions. Marielle Herzeg, uh, current teacher advisory council member, says a time of change, uh, church gaining power, disease and poverty, feudalism, chivalry. Good friend Teresa Lawler, I believe from Iowa, religious power combined with the Canterbury Tales and some really fun individuals. Now they're starting to swim in. They are. Transition between the ancient world and modern, emerging mm. urbanization, contact with the Arab world. <laughs> Beautiful dresses. Yeah, exactly. I love that. I love that. Beautiful <laughs> dresses. Saxon um, invasions, Jennifer Julian says, Age of Enlightenment. Mm -hmm. um, I also saw the Mort d'Artour appear up there, uh, oh. along with prototypical church archetype. Hmm. And um, and Jacqueline Dukes brings up the brings up you know pacifism as as against the Crusades and the romanticization of the Crusades. Um, oh, these are just absolutely wonderful answers. Thank you, Pearlie. Thank you, Kayla. Yeah, and they are so. One of the things I'll, I'll say um, there's quite a lot of breadth in these answers. These are clearly answers from some pretty learned people, from, you know, from some teachers who've, you know, who've been around some study of the Middle Ages. Um, but even still, I see a few themes coming through, uh, and they certainly have to do with situating the Middle Ages as in between, uh, as in between classical antiquity and modernity, um, as being, uh, as, as being violent, um, at least in as much as you know, in as much as chivalry involves battle, uh, the Crusades, of course, are a form of violence as well. Um, but some one of the things we don't talk about all too often uh, when we talk about the Middle Ages in popular discourse, we don't talk about the intellectual resistance to crusading. Um, that uh, that was quite common among a lot of church intellectuals. Um, there were a number of sermons preached against crusading by the sword in favor of, quote, crusading by the word, uh, which very much meant pre crusading by preaching in order to convince people, uh, to convince um, Muslims especially, but also Jewish people, 
to convert to Christianity. Um, some of the most violent scenes of the Crusades, which did involve the massacres of Jewish communities and Muslim communities, um, were uh, lambasted by, you know, uh, by, by theologians who were quite critical of that sort of violence. Now, of course, that didn't help the people who had suffered that violence at the hands of Crusaders. Um, we also have to keep in mind, too, that for many crusaders, their, um, their motivations were not necessarily religious. In some cases, they were, don't get me wrong, but we don't talk enough about the economic uh, motivations that many crusaders had. Um, a lot of crusaders went uh, went east in search of honor that would then make them much more marriageable when they came back to the West, um, that would allow them to, to marry women of more means and therefore gain more land and more important lordships themselves because of this honor they had gained on crusade. Um, so there was that to be done. Also, there was quite a lot of money made off of uh, money lending, so that poor nobility, of which there was quite a lot in the late Middle Ages, could go on crusade. Um, so they would borrow uh, quite often at um, at some very high interest rates. Um, and uh, so there was quite a lot of money made off of that. And some of you might be thinking, well, you know, was it made by, uh, was it made by the Jewish bankers who, um, who were the only people allowed in uh, Western Europe to, uh, to accept interest. Some of it was made by them, but they were pretty quickly divested of it as well. So they were quite often exploited, where this, they did make some money, but then uh, they had to pay very high taxes themselves to the crown in many Western European nations. Um, so that's just a little bit of context around the Crusades and the multiple sides of those discourses that we don't, that we all too often don't discuss. So let me return to um, we return to the the PowerPoint here, and think for a moment pedagogically about how we might most effectively ask our students this question: What do the Middle Ages mean to you? The, um, I, I just quickly thought of some discussion techniques that make a lot of sense, uh, but that work in differently in different contexts. Open discussion, I find that that tends to work very well in a classroom that's already pretty well cohered and that is relatively small. Um, you can get pretty high, I find that off this question, you can get pretty high participation if those conditions exist. However, um, other classrooms, those that have not cohered yet, um, or those where I've already noted some, um, some uh, dynamics where certain students or certain groups of students are much more participatory than others, I tend to use anonymous instructor curated discussion. I'll ask a question, an open-ended question such as that, and I will have the students answer anonymously, um, either by you know, sometimes simply writing, you know, writing by hand for a few minutes and handing all of that in and me going through it. Um, and um, let's see. And uh, sometimes also using technological means to have them submit their answers to me. Um, also, in certain classrooms, sort of medium-sized classrooms, uh, where there's been some cohesion, but there are other reasons to not really go in for all, all the way open discussion. I use the think, pair, and share method. I'm sure many of you have used that method, uh, some of you probably quite extensively. And I tend to randomize who's paired, um, which, uh, which often produces some really interesting discussions among the students. And then when we all come back together, uh, we'll have select pairings share their findings. And I've found that that can really jumpstart a discussion from there on out. 
So I just wanted to share with you all a little bit of my, my observations from when I teach in this vein. Now to move into um, to move into teaching medieval literature and culture, um, which I might also call teaching medievalism, uh, I want to uh, I want to bring to the table the fact that one of the first one of the strongest um, veins in my courses is asserting the relevance of the Middle Ages to students' modern lives. In doing so, I often use quite a bit of the news cycle. Um, in the last several years have made, you know, have made that quite, um, quite doable too. Many of you will recognize this image um, this is an image from the Unite the Right rally held in Charlottesville, Virginia in August 2017. Um, you, I'm sure you saw some of these on the news where, where this large group, of, large group of demonstrators, many of whom associate themselves with the alt-right or other far-right groups, uh, marched on the campus in defense of uh, one of its statues, or in, in defense of a nearby statue. Um, and they are carrying tiki torches. At first glance, this image doesn't seem to have much to do with the Middle Ages. And, you know, many students certainly express that when they first see it. However, this is another image from the same rally. Now, there are several things going on with this image. Um, you have uh, you have the these all, uh, young men who are almost certainly uh, uh, associated with the alt right because of their choice of white white polo shirts and khaki pants. Um, uh, it's seen in that group as a sort of uh, a respectable attire, almost like the American business casual uniform. Um, and it's a way of claiming a respectability and claiming Americanness at the same time. Uh, of course, they're wearing battle helmets. In the background, we see the Confederate flag, but we also see the US flag. But right here in the center, this young man is carrying a shield, um, a shield created in medieval style, emblazoned with the whole, with the black eagle, which is the insignia of the Holy Roman Empire. The political constellation um, brought into being on Christmas Day in the year 800 when Charlemagne was crowned Holy Roman Emperor. And the Holy Roman Empire existed in one form or another clear through the 19th century. So he's carrying a very, very medieval, or I, I often call this kind of modern medievalism, medievalizing uh, symbol. This, uh, this actually should come when we, well, when we get a little deeper into things in a moment, this will come as no surprise to you anymore if it's a surprise right now. While I'm using the news cycle, however, I don't stop at just uh, young men in Charlottesville with their tiki torches or just political happenings such as that one. Medievalism shows up in all sorts of ways. Here we have a screenshot from uh, one of the closing episodes of Game of Thrones. And you see here that there's a similar kind of a similar kind of militarism um, on the faces of the alt-right demonstrators and on the faces of the actors portraying um, King's Landing peasants seeking to get into the city walls for fear of an attack on the city. And then, of course, we have one of the show's stars, the character Jamie Lannister, making clear that those who are about to close the gates know who he is by raising 
his uh, prosthetic arm um, so that he can get into the city. Game of Thrones is, of course, one of our most popular, um, one of our most popular items of medievalism in recent years. And in fact, its showrunners, um, uh, D.B. Weiss and David Benioff, as well as the writer, um, the writer of the novels, The Song of Ice and Fire, George R. R. Martin, have all been quoted as saying that what they aim to do in the, uh, in the show is to create a, rather not to create, but to express, um, to represent the quote, real Middle Ages as they actually were. It's another quote of theirs. Um, and along those lines, they've also spoken of brutality and violence. However, as I've already said, there are other discourses in the Middle Ages that, um, that are not as readily addressed in that show. But I also bring this up while showing these two images to point out that there's another element of the Middle Ages that um, if they're aiming to, uh, to show you the real Middle Ages, there's an element at which, uh, at which they've failed. If you note, there are two, in addition to the militarism on the faces, there is something else quite in common between these two uh, images. And one of them, uh, well, the, the major thing that jumps out to me and that often jumps out to my students when I bring this up is that in both of these cases, the faces are 100% those of people who present as white who present as having European ancestry. This, of course, makes a lot of sense uh, with the tenets of alt-right political ideology, makes a ton of sense in terms of who was marching on Charlottesville in 2017. Um, however, regarding this image of the peasantry in King's Landing, it doesn't make as much sense at all, rationally, it only makes sense in the context of how we have thought, how we've long thought about the European Middle Ages in popular discourse, that we tend to think of them as racially, culturally, and religiously homogenous. I'll say more about, uh, as we move along, I'll say more about the reasons why we tend to think of them that way. And then we'll also talk about some evidence, uh, quite a bit of evidence to the contrary. But while we're still on the subject of the news cycle, I wanted to spend a little more time with, um, with some other modern iterations of medievalism. Here we have um, a well-known photograph from a November 2016 meeting of the National Policy Institute, uh, which is a, an, a think tank and institute, really the seat of the alt-right, um, as created by Richard Spencer, one of the movement's leaders. This meeting got pretty famous because as he discussed the recent election um, in November 2016, um, the many in the audience offered this hand signal, um, which was roundly taken to be a uh, to be sig similar to the Nazi salute. Um, and here we see a comparison uh, just by showing an image of the same salute being offered to Adolf Hitler in the 1930s during a meeting. However, we should, we should take note that even a, even a show as medievalist as Game of Thrones took quite a lot of its cues from uh, images and art surrounding Nazi Germany in their closing episodes. Um, quite a bit of the, uh, of the art around, um, the Princess Daenerys Targaryen's uh, taking of the city of King's Landing 
was said to be inspired by Nazi Germany. And of course, we've seen this in other places. You see this in um, in in the, the Star Wars franchise as well. Um, so it's not that Game of Thrones is necessarily new for using um, the art and iconography of Nazi Germany to express um, concerns about uh, tyrannical and imperial political behavior. Um, but in a show that's as medievalist as this one is, it is something we ought to take note of uh, for a variety of reasons. So I want to double back on the relationship between Game of Thrones and medievalism and the early 20th century and the rise of the Nazi party by turning your attention to a philosophical concept, um, to a school of philosophy known as tradition or traditionalism. The Italian philosopher, um, uh, and medievalist and antiquarian Julius Evola is largely seen as one of the biggest figures in this movement of tradition. In his uh, in his rather well read um, early 20th century text called the Synthesis of the Doctrine of Race, um, he well, he seeks to synthesize the idea of race. This was actually an incredibly important text from Benito Mussolini, who found support for his racist movement's uh, position that eugenics would improve the Italian race, as Mussolini called it, by restoring to it the quote, and I'm quoting here, uh, the lost Roman virtues of courage, fortitude, discipline, and martial ardor. Um, now, there was good reason for Mussolini finding evidence for this in Evola's work. Um, Evola, part of Evola's medievalism and antiquarianism was also a deep anti-modernism. Um, he, let's see, it's been said of Evola's work that he advanced, uh, quote, a radical doctrine of anti-egalitarianism, anti-democracy, anti-liberalism, and anti-Semitism. He scorned the modern world of popular rule and bourgeois values, democracy, and socialism, seeing capitalism and communism as twin aspects of the benighted reign of materialism. So that's a lot to take in, just hearing it, and I don't have that up on the screen for you. Uh, but essentially, he was against everything. Everything that you would associate with modernity. He's against, I'll just say it again, egalitarianism, democracy, liberalism, and for anti-Semitism. Um, he's also against popular rule, against what he saw as bourgeois values, against democracy and socialism, and saw capitalism and communism as basically the same thing. So for Evola, this, um, this tradition with a capital T is something that's actually to be found in the Middle Ages. Um, he makes over the idea of medieval knighthood, of medieval chivalry as a spiritual identity that is more important than and even in place of religious identity. He's not concerned for Christianity or the church. Instead, he's concerned that medieval knighthood represents a set of spiritual and ethical values that connect any chivalrous deed to an inner action. So for him, chivalry supersedes time and place. This, this I have argued, is why, um, uh, why we often see alt-right and other far-right demonstrators taking up the trappings of knighthood, taking up the trappings of chivalry. And a great number of them have actually used, uh, or, you know, a great number of sort of the leading lights of the far right movement. Uh, this includes Spencer, this includes Steve Bannon, et cetera. Uh, they use Evola, they use Julius Evola's work directly. Um, they cite him, 
uh, Bannon, and actually Spencer, has called him, quote, one of the most interesting men of the 20th century, end quote. I wanted to say a bit the, about the quote you have up on the screen, um, which just gives you a sense of what this tradition with a capital T is about, uh, the global rehabilitation of tradition, the sacred, the religious, the caste-related, the hierarchical and not equality, justice, or freedom. And, and those who are engaged in thinking about tradition this way uh, are often interested in returning to the Middle Ages or turning to them to look for inspiration. So I want to pause here and take a look at a question we have from Alex Christman. Um, and I'll read this question aloud. Is there some daylight between Mussolini's emulation of Rome and Hitler's seeming admiration for pre-Roman and pre-Christian German folklore? At least as far as I'm aware, didn't Hitler want to go back to before the Middle Ages and wasn't a great fan of Christianity? So it's interesting you should bring this up. This is actually quite connected with, um, with the ideas that we have from Evola that the you know that the christian church has some good things about it but that it's essentially um well he how does he call it he calls it benighted exoteric christianity meaning it's too concerned with the devotional uh it overshadows whatever of these spiritual and ethical values it carries with it um evola does express some um does express some uh he does give some honor to the fact that the church once it expands out of the mediterranean and into northern europe does take on more of a uh, uh does incorporate more of a germanic uh sort of heroic approach to um to the world and even supersedes some of that germanic heroic approach onto christ uh, which we certainly find in some of the uh, in some Anglo-Saxon sort of late Ang late Old English um, and early English Christian writing. So yes, yeah, so there's certainly I would certainly say there's some there is some daylight there. Um, so let me go on. The alt right, as I've as I've been suggesting, but now I'll say it outright. The alt-right, so named by Richard Spencer, can trace its roots to the Italian fascism of the early 20th century. Folks like Spencer and like Bannon owe their philosophies you know, to reading Evola directly, but also to um, a particular Russian political analyst and professor named Alexandra Dugin, D-U-G-I-N, who has written voluminously in, su in support of this quote global rehabilitation of tradition and returning the returning to the middle ages or turning to them to look for inspiration um, indeed one tenant of far right ideology far and alt right ideology is to agitate for the transformation of the united states in into a polity in which membership requires whiteness in which the United States becomes a white ethnostate, or at least strives to become a white ethnostate. Um, they often point to medieval Europe as a as an example of um, of historical white ethnostates. Um, I, as you might imagine, I argue that that is categorically incorrect and does not reflect the actual demographics of medieval Europe. Like the fascists, today's alt-right leaders and adherents seek a return to, to in addition to a, this idea of a white ethnostate, they seek a return to a time when power was also unassailable, when power seemed divinely authorized, um, and when power belonged to people with whom they identify. Uh, a significant, perhaps the most significant element in alt-right and fascist claims to historical power is the deployment of history known as palingenesis. Some of you may be familiar with this term, uh, some of you may not. Um, I'm actually just going to type it into the chat box. 
and I think everybody will be able to see that. Yes, <laughs> yes, that should work. Yep. Great. So, you know, so this idea of palingenesis um, is defined as the phenomenon uh, of a myth of national resurgence and regeneration. Um, in other words, um, I'll give you an example from uh, political theorist Roger Griffin, who defines it further as palingenetic ultranationalism. And one of the things he says is that all permutations of fascism have in common that their ideology, policies, and any organizations formed to implement them are informed by a distinctive permutation of the myth that the nation needs to be or is about to be resurrected phoenix-like from the fortunes from the forces of decadence which without drastic intervention by the forces of healthy nationalism threaten to extinguish it forever so in other words the nation is collapsing and the nation must you know, be brought back to life by the forces of healthy nationalism, which will make it rise from the ashes like a phoenix. I do see what Jamie Gellner has, has uh, posted um, in the chat, and it is, it is a very good example of the use of palingenetic ultranationalism. Um, when palingenesis is combined, however, with the myth of a radical crusade against decadence, and for renewal in every sphere of national life, then the theorist Roger Griffin argues, that's when the conditions for fascism are met. So when it becomes a universalizing ideology that really creeps into every aspect of national life. Um, and it creates a totalizing worldview that then submits the value of all people, all places, all things to the discernment of the people who are in control of that palingenetic ultranationalist state. So I just wanted to make you aware of those concepts and how those are operating um, and how those have a connection to medievalism and the use of the, the, use of the Middle Ages um, as an example uh, for when those, uh, as an example for when these kinds of states existed, at least in this ideological mindset. So let me take us on to the next slide here. Um, so before I before we look at the slide itself, I'll just say that one of the major parts of uh, the use of the Middle Ages in a kind of palingenetic ultranationalism is revering feudalism. And I know feudalism was brought up by one of our participants early on as something you think about when you think of the Middle Ages. Well, for a thinker like Evola and those who have followed him, uh, European feudalism during the Middle Ages is a great example of how society should run. Um, they view the feudal social structure as representative of inflexible social hierarchy. So that you know you can't you know you can't jump classes. You you if you're born a peasant you stay a peasant. If you're born a lord you stay a lord. Um, and they uh, you know and, and followers of Evola also tend to view this as beneficial for U.S. sovereignty. That this would be a corrective roadmap for U.S. society. So part of the U.S. rising from uh, the ashes like a phoenix is also to reinstantiate something like feudalism. And they view those who try to, who are going to try to make that happen as knightly, as being chivalric, as being these knights who are imbued with this extra religious spiritual power. Um, so I bring up this quote. This, uh, the quote on, on the, the slide here is actually from Stormfront, um, the well-known white nationalist website. And this is just from a rank and file user of Stormfront. Um, and it was found in, in August of 2017. Quote, the belief that everyone was a slave during the Middle Ages is a liberal lie. Serfs were serfs and happy that way. Lords were happy as lords and kings likewise. Society was nearly flawless 
and prosperous in Europe and Asia under a feudal economy and government. Now, I, I find any statement that calls any society nearly flawless rather uh, difficult to get on board with. Um, the scholar who quotes this in some of her published writing um, is the, the medievalist Helen Young out of Deakin University in Australia. And she goes on to say, you know, it's easy to dismiss such a statement as um, historically ridiculous and in any case, it's just another individual end quote. I would go to say that, you know, the fact that it's just another individual goes to show just how deeply embedded these ideas of the Middle Ages are and these deployments of the Middle Ages are in certain circles. Um, such that, you know, in my own teaching, I strive to remain quite cognizant of that and to, uh, to do to do what I can to dislodge any idea of, of medieval innocence where uh, class hierarchy was uncomplicated, um, where, you know, or certainly where feudalism was a flawless economic system um, and left everyone prosperous. Um, I tend to do this by bringing up things like uh, the Black Death in 1349, 1350, and how that changed the dynamic of wage labor in, um, in, in England, also on the continent, but in England especially, where Parliament really, really strived after that to control the, um, to control the, the wages that migrant laborers were able to, uh, to charge for their work, which had gone up you know, quite a bit because there were fewer migrant laborers alive and a lot of a lot of uh, lordly houses did still need did still need farm work done in order for them to survive so you know so this really did change the balance of power and you can see it in the parliamentary roles throughout the latter half of the 14th century that um, that the government is struggling to figure out how to uh, they would have seen it as how to set the economy right again. So um, I like I like Alex Christman's uh, comment here. Also, if it was flawless, why did so many Europeans come to Massachusetts, Virginia, Pennsylvania, etc.? <laughs> They're good questions. Um, you know, now of course there were uh, uh, flawless. Depends on who it was flawless for. Right, and I do think our our um, writer here would is, is very much writing from the perspective of uh, imagining themselves a knight or a lord. They're imagining themselves the people who you know people who maybe would be better off under that system, and and in many ways they weren't really either, but um, but they can certainly be imagined that way if you're imagining an uncomplicated. Middle Ages. So, I wanted to um, wanted to sort of to maybe not go over, but discuss uh, some of the readings uh, that you you looked at for today. Um, I chose these readings because they give you a uh, they give you a couple different perspectives. They give you a sense of how. Um, how university style medieval studies has been changing in some ways quite drastically over the last several decades. Um, they give you a sense as well of how uh, scholars in the classroom have been uh, aiming to deal with uh, medievalism in public discourse, especially when that medievalism in public discourse is racist in nature or violent in nature. Um, as well as uh, to give you a sense of the uh, the sheer plethora of theoretical concepts that we can draw out of the evidence that allow us to make sense of the use of the Middle Ages for um, uh, for political purposes, for racist purposes, uh, and how one how one can also um, Diffuse some of those uses. Um, so I, maybe I'll just hmm, 
Let's see. How shall I do this? Regarding. And, I, and, and okay. I'm sorry, uh, Cord, and part of my job, unfortunate job, is the moderators to remind you of the time. We've got about a half an hour left. Okay. That's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. Um, I think one of the, let's see, one of the approaches, eh, here's, here's an approach. Taking all the readings together, um, I want to, to throw this out to the, the crowd a little bit. Taking all the readings together, um, what, uh, throw out in the chat box some of the concepts that you'd like to talk about a little bit more. Something that stuck with you, something that you know, you're know you starting to think about how to use it in your own classroom um, from, uh, from the readings for today. And while you're taking a moment and thinking about that, I want to have a look here at what Martha Regalis has just sent to us. So while you read that court, I'm again going to encourage and invite all of our participants uh, who are now frantically uh, flipping through the readings <laughs> and up on the screen. Um, you know, what, what kinds of issues were brought up? What kinds of things do you struggle with um, as you as you attempt to connect, make these connections with your younger students? Um, what are some of the key concepts from the readings that uh, that still linger for you that we can address in the remaining time? Um, it's not lost to me, by the way, that at least two of our, uh, our participants tonight are in Charlottesville, and you know, so there's always a contemporary lens on on these sort of historic questions. But tell tell us tell us what you're curious about. And Martha's comment was so strong that I had to scroll up to to see it all. Thank you, Martha. <laughs> and I'm, while people are thinking, I'm going to go ahead and read Martha's comment aloud. Um, but not all critiques of the modern involve a totalizing worldview. Adorno and Horkheimer's The Culture Industry is a Mass Deception from the Dialectic of Enlightenment comes to mind, as does Peter Leslitz's The World We Have Lost. Adorno, of course, went on to his monumental work on the Authorian personality and on another topic, the dislocations of war, famine, dynastic change, and morality rates of 33 to 50 percent in plague years should be enough to suggest that Chaucer's England, for example, was hardly an idyllic place. <laughs> well, I think, yeah, I mean, you're absolutely correct. Um, uh, and I mean, we could go on and on with the, you know, with the evidence. Um, another um, another uh, um, well-known bit of uh, theoretical philosophical work that comes to mind that we've only recently figured out is is as influenced by the Middle Ages and feudalism as uh, as it is is Hegel's phenomenology of spirit. Um, you know, Hegel's phenomenology of spirit has often been taken to be sort of the quintessential, um, you know, quintessential modernizing text. It's where we get our idea of the um, the master-slave dialectic, right? The idea that which ultimately comes down to the fact that um, when you have a, a master and a slave, the master, uh, the master, it turns out, cannot actually be recognized as a master unless the slave recognizes his power. So ultimately, the master is really indebted to the slave. And this is often taken as, you know, as a uh, sort of realization of sovereignty that feeds into the development of the modern self and helps us form democratic societies. Uh, to put it, you know, that's painting with a broad, broad brush. But, um, but the fact of the matter is, we have recently learned that Hegel, uh, much of Hegel's experience of his 18th century Germany was very, very feudal in nature. So when he's thinking about the master-slave dialectic, which is actually better translated as the Lord Bondsman dialectic, i.e. Lord Tenant Farmer dialectic, um, he's developing this idea of sovereignty and this development of uh, thinking about what free will is and how you ultimately leading to how you develop a social contract among people with free will He's thinking about all that through the lens of a very medieval form of production. So 
we can't have modernity without the Middle Ages. And in, you know, and <laughs> when I put it boldly, I say modernity is the Middle Ages. We hmm. just all too often don't know it. So. Uh, Cord, we have two or three topics and questions that are starting to queue up and I'm gonna do these yeah. in sort of reverse order. I'd like to start actually with uh, Amelia Simpson, who I believe is a teacher here in North Carolina who asks um, or sort of notes that as an English teacher, she really likes the discussion of Chaucer. Uh, she often teaches her students that uh, they can learn a lot about the attitudes of the era of the era by looking at the literature, in particular, this sort of blame the Jews for everything attitude seen in a lot of plague literature. Can you comment mm -hmm. on that, please? Sure, absolutely. I mean, I am, I, I, Amelia, I, I feel you. I'm a huge proponent of examining, you know, examining the culture and the attitudes of the era by going through its literature. I think we get quite a bit out of that. Um, in a way, through the literature, the, you know, the people of the era are still with us. They're, they're still alive. Um, so, uh, I love your question went up. There it is again. Um, right. So I would say um, one of the places I, I tend to go for thinking about anti-Jewish discourse and the troubling of anti-Jewish discourse is um, not only the plague literature, but something that's really quite readily available, Chaucer's Prioress's Tale. Um, and in the Prioress's Tale, uh, for, for those who don't know it, it's the story of a young Christian boy in a, quote, great city in Asia who has to walk every day through a Jewish neighborhood um, and while he's doing so, he's usually singing a hymn to the Virgin Mary. Uh, it is a blood libel story um, in that uh, late medieval blood libel stories are often stories of, um, you know, wicked Jewish characters killing innocent Christians, especially innocent Christian children. Uh, the boy is murdered. The boy is found having been tossed into a toilet. Um, yet even in death, he is still singing to the Virgin Mary, and that's his miracle. Um, what we find in that text, though, as we find, I think, in a lot of Chaucerian texts, is that while on its surface, the text is strikingly anti-Semitic, when you start to read it more closely, you see that there's also a criticism of the way the, you know, the Christian characters act in the text they also act in a mob-like fashion, right? And we see them act in a mob-like fashion. Whether or not it was a Jewish mob who killed the boy always remains under the surface. That always remains off stage. Another text that does a really great job for this is the 14th century alliterative siege of Jerusalem. Um, the siege, is a, for many years, was treated only as a strikingly anti-Semitic text. Uh, a close reading of that text reveals it's actually quite sympathetic to, uh, quite sympathetic to its Jewish characters and shows them to actually be more virtuous in many ways than the Christian characters in the text. Now, there are a couple things you can do with that. The, um, you know, the highly, the highly virtuous, the highly virtuous Jew in a text that's going to be read mostly by medieval Christians um, is a way of calling out the medieval Christians to examine their own spiritual condition. It's a way of calling them out to, um, you know, to see it, to see how bad off they are in terms of their their uh, their spiritual welfare. So it's still not. You know, it's a kind of sympathy that's still self-serving, but it's a kind of sympathy nonetheless. Great. Cord, if you don't mind, go over to the chat box and type those two titles in for me. Sure. And as you do that, uh, I'm going to condense a couple of other questions. Um, I'll give you a minute to type those in. Okay. Thanks, Cord. Um, mm -hmm. There's one. And, you know, we're, we're getting a, a lot of conversation, a lot of questions about race and ethnicity yes. um, outside of anti-Semitism. And in fact, Amber, I'm sorry, I didn't see you in the room. Amber Roberts, who is also in Charlottesville. And of course, all communities are struggling on uh, giving students, younger people, the tools to understand uh, 
you know, the, the delicate construct of race and place and social justice in Albemarle County and Charlottesville because of what happened in two, two August ago uh, is yeah. really uh, facing it head on. And so I, I think I'd like to combine uh, a couple of questions, one from Tammy and, um, and one from Michael and one from Amber to say, can you talk a little bit about, uh, about race ideals, about the construct of race, and then maybe ideally give some uh, suggestions on uh, texts or literature for younger people that might explore those same uh, concepts that you, that you revealed? Mm -hmm. Sure, so I think this is a good point to move ahead in the uh, in the slides a little bit because I, I have some stuff for you here that will help us have this discussion we sort of already we're kind of moving through the text that were read and drawing key concepts out of them so I'm going to skip ahead a little bit here uh, let's see so you know I, I want to bring to your attention some primary medieval evidence of how medieval people thought about race especially uh, some visual evidence um and literary evidence so i mentioned earlier the young men with the holy roman imperial eagle um now if any of you don't follow online on twitter or on instagram medieval poc you might want to do that medieval poc she is a a an art historian a practicing art historian who regularly f sources and posts images of people who are you know, either African or Asian in appearance, uh, in presentation, in medieval texts and art. So she writes here after Charlottesville, Nazis aren't very happy that I keep posting the original medieval European bearer of this standard, St. Maurice. And that is because that's St. Maurice. St. Maurice was the, holy, was the patron saint of the Holy Roman Empire and from about the mid 1200s on was almost always depicted in and around Germany as African in appearance. And indeed his legend calls him an Egyptian. Um, so here you have, you know, a very vaunted holy figure um, who's almost always depicted as African in appearance. This, and here's just some more of St. Maurice, this is him. Uh, his very famous statue at Magdeburg Cathedral in Germany. Um, and th I bring this up as one example of the fact that uh, skin color difference worked very differently for medieval people. Uh, and it was because the primary discourse of interest in medieval Europe was uh, had to do with religious identity and state of one's and the state of one's soul. So, um, they considered, you know, whether you were black, white, yellow, in between, whatever, didn't mean anything. What meant was what you were internal, uh, what mattered was what your, what condition your soul was internally. That's what mattered the most. But there was a discourse bumping up against it. And that discourse got even stronger in the Crusades. Because in the Crusades, you did have to figure out, you know, you were, uh, I want to preface this by saying medieval people always traveled. Medieval people had always traveled. Um, nowhere was completely homogenous even before the Crusades. But the Crusades did really increase the amount of travel uh, and, and decrease the amount of time it took between Western Europe and the Middle East. And one of the things this did was it increased contact between different kinds of people uh, who needed to do business together and who couldn't rely on reputation because they were just showing up in town. They needed to do business quickly, et cetera, et cetera. So a discourse called physiognomy, um, and I'll just type that in real quick. Physiognomy became really important. And when it did, what physiognomies are is they are often short texts that tell you how to judge somebody's character and whether you should do business with them or not, based on various aspects of how they look and behave. So, you know, it's the color of their eyes, the color of their hair, the slant of their nose, 
whether they talk with their hands a lot or not. Um, these things can mean they're quick to become angry or they're not trustworthy or they're very trustworthy or they tend to be rather lethargic and, you know, and, and not industrious. And skin color was just one of those items, not by any means the primary one, but it was one of them. And as it became one of them, and as physiognomy and economic expediency began to overtake the discourse of trying to convert everybody to Roman Catholic Christianity and becoming, you know, so that the church would become a global, a church with global dominion, um, you know, as that, that began to cede primacy to this discourse of, who can we do business with faster, better, and making more money in the process? Um, so, uh, so that's to, to say a bit about where race is. I often put it this way. I say, you know, there was a burgeoning race thinking discourse in the Middle Ages, but in the Middle Ages, it was always in service to a primary discourse of how to make the church, the Roman Catholic church, global. And in making it global, the church, of course, was ready to accept all people, no matter what they looked like. This, for instance, is why, um, also in the late Middle Ages, the three wise men that we venerate at Christmas time in the Christian tradition becomes um, becomes a, a really, really interesting, um, really interesting uh, cultural artifact. Uh, stories circulate about them much more than ever before. Uh, a whole legend is put together of them called the Three Kings of Cologne. And that circulates widely in the period. Um, and when they're depicted, they're almost always depicted as representing all three parts of the known world, Europe, Africa, and Asia which were also the three parts of the known world that were attributed, um, whose genealogies were attributed to Noah's three sons. So, you know, medieval people were surrounded by an image of three very holy men, one of whom was always black, one of whom was always Asian, one of whom was always white. And that was supposed to mean, you know, that was supposed to, it was really a symbol for the church's uh, aspirations toward global dominion. Um, let's see, what's our time? We're at 818. Yeah, we've got probably about a little of five or six minutes uh, to go, I think. And okay. I'm going to circle back and take the second part of Michael's question. Um, and again, I combined two or three questions about race and these ideals. Um, and any of those I think that you can move through would be helpful. But Michael also is interested in the symbolism uh, that's found in propaganda now and then, and the connection between those that symbology and and, uh, and maybe some of these more commonly commonly seen markers. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Sure, um, you know that symbolic. I mean, I I could go on. <laughs> I could go on for a lot longer than five minutes. Yeah. Um, you know, some of the symbology we see now and that we have seen in the 20th century. Um, uh, has a lot of it has really interesting individual histories. Um, for instance, the the swastika, as designed in the 20th century, is ultimately taken from a design uh, on 12th century French Merovingian decorative excuse me decorative discs. These were um, these appeared in a castle. Uh, in a medieval castle that Heinrich Heimler um, took over during the heady days of the expansion of the National Socialist Party in, in Germany. Um, and he found this symbol and thought, well, let's update this symbol. And the symbol that he updated it into ultimately became the symbol for the Nazi party. Um, but it has its roots in the 12th century decorative motif. Um, you know, some of the other symbology we see now, uh, also uh, one that showed up at, at, at uh, Charlottesville, and indeed that was, um, there's actually a relatively famous image of James Alex Fields, the, uh, the demonstrator who drove his car into a crowd of people and killed Heather Heyer in the process. 
um, there's an image of him earlier that day with a group who were carrying ba um, really shield, actually shields, with fasces emblazoned on them. And fasces are actually pre-medieval. Fasces, are, that's going back to classical antiquity. Fasces are a symbol of Roman imperial power. Um, so that, you know, in fact, Roman lictors would carry them with them basically as a sign of real brute power. Um, during military parades, the idea was if anybody got out of line, they could pull these fasces out, um, you know, out of their, you know, out of the bag they were carrying them in, generally on their back, and beat people with them. Um, or uh, sometimes they would, you know, they often also had a small axe on the end of them, um, and you could take that small axe and chop down something to beat people with. So, uh, if you needed something bigger than the fasces itself. Um, so, uh, so that's just a little bit about some of the, you know, some of the symbols we're seeing and their relationships to history. Um, I will say the Washington Post did a really, really good extensive piece uh, uh, after Charlottesville where they moved through a number of the symbols, not all of them historical by any means, but some of them, a lot of historical um, symbols were included in it. So that's worth looking at. And so, and it seems, it seems both by what you're sharing and what Medieval POC does on Twitter, it seems like the way to puncture that sort of uh, misconception is to show these side by side and you know, whether oh, yeah. it's a teaching tool or a conversational tool to really uh, see the origins of these symbols that are being uh, manipulated and, and misremembered. Precisely and also to deal with how you know how those misrememberings and manipulations uh, affect our daily you know affect what we see and and how we experience uh, how we experience what's left of the actual medieval world you know, and how it's it's colored, um, how our idea, our ideas of the Middle Ages color our reception of medieval artifacts. So for instance, here on the slide I've given you, um, it's just a side by side of the famous Black Madonna of the Cathedral of Chartres in France, um, who was venerated for many years as, you know, the Black Madonna. And then recently, I, also in 2017, there was a restoration done of the whole cathedral and pretty much everything dark in the cathedral was considered to have been simply blackened from such from all the candles which is actually not a good explanation but that's uh what it was considered to be and so this is what the black madonna looks like now on the right and quite wow. a lot of people are upset by that the fact of the matter is medieval sculptors and medieval people um, painted and repainted and repainted and repainted. So it would not be inconceivable that at some point, they, some point in the Middle Ages, she may have appeared uh, as she does on the right, as she does again now, but she may have also been painted dark pigments, dark pigments at various points throughout the years as well. Because as I said earlier, they did not have the same stigma regarding, you know, dark skin on a holy figure. Right. Um, so that's something to keep in mind as well. Even the fact that it's as controversial uh, that the restoration, and if we can call it that, became as controversial as it did, is very much because it's now all seen through the lens of modern racial ideology which is just not where medieval uh, medieval people and medieval thought were, what well, was. Um, and here you can see the New York Times proclaims it a controversial restoration that wipes away the past. Mm. Um, you also asked about some texts. I wanted to point out a few here, uh, literary evidence in translation. Uh, Andy, will, the, uh, will, will folks have access to this PowerPoint later yeah. on? Yes. So you actually have some links in here to uh, some of these uh, pieces are online. Um, Chaucer's Man of Law's Tale in translation um, on the Harvard Chaucer page, it's an interlinear translation, which might be a lot of fun to use with older, you know, with older students, I'd say, certainly say secondary, secondary and, and up, um, maybe even middle school and up. 
Um, and then uh, Neville Coghill's poetic, fully modern English translation is quite beautiful. It takes some license because it is poetic, but it's quite beautiful. And then uh, the same for Chaucer's Squire's Tale. Uh, the Squire's Tale is very much, a, if, if you don't know it, that one's very much a romance, uh, a romance about the East, uh, but it's much more fanciful than what we have in The Man of Law's Tale, which is also considered a romance, but it's really the story of a singular, you know, human heroine who's in many ways seen as a, often seen as a sort of converting force. She's almost a, a sort of a crusader by the word rather than the sword. Chaucer Squire's tale is the beautiful story of jilted love as told largely by a talking, uh, by a talking love bird, who's a literal bird. So it's quite, quite a sweet mm -hmm. story. Thank you. Um, as well as uh, the book of John Mandeville. The book of John Mandeville is something that, uh, here it is in translation from Hackett Publishing. Um, this is a text that uh, even with younger students, you might be able to uh, successfully excerpt um, successfully excerpt certain chapters because the peoples of the world who are presented in this text, and real quick, this is a wildly popular 14th century story of a, an, a Northern English knight who, you know, basically travels the whole world. I mean, he's trying to go to Jerusalem. He ends up going beyond Jerusalem. And it's the people he encounters along the way, many of whom are quote unquote monstrous peoples, meaning they're human-ish, they're humanoid, but they're not quite human. Their heads are in their chests or they walk on their hands. And, you know, a lot of these, uh, these fanciful creatures are actually drawn from classical antiquity. Um, but it's really quite a fanciful, um, some of these chapters really give you some quite fanciful stories that younger students might really take to. Um, one of my favorite groups of people he discusses are the apple smelling people. Hmm. And they're a group of people who, um, who live, they don't eat, they don't drink, they only live by the smell of apples. And um, he talks about them, you know, the text is both judgmental and sympathetic. And he says that they're not, they're not reasonable. They're not reasonable because it's not rational to live by the smell of apples. Yet here they are living by the smell of apples. And he says that when they leave the, when they're outside of the smell of apples, they die. Um, so, and then he goes on again about how unreasonable they are. And then he says that whenever they travel, they just take the apples with them, which is an absolutely rational thing to do. So this text is full of moments like that, where you can really, you know, I, I, I think especially even with elementary students, you can draw out, you know, what, uh, you know, is, is the text serious here? Is the text being honest? when it says that these people do this thing and this thing isn't sensible. But when you look at what they're doing, it's quite sensible indeed. It's really fantastic. Cord, we just have a moment or two left and I'd actually like to, uh, to conclude tonight's uh, webinar with a question that sort of circles back and calls back to my original first question to you. Uh, when we began the webinar, you might recall uh, that I, I asked you to tell us the primary misconceptions or incorrect assumptions that you encounter when you talk to younger people and students, both in your college classes and elsewhere. So I'd actually, I'd like to invite you to, to maybe leave us with one big takeaway. You're here, you're a time traveler. You've come to us from, uh, from the middle age, from the medieval uh, time. Tell, tell us what you'd really like us to take away to understand this as we represent it to, uh, to younger students. We, well, I will speak as a medieval person. And I will say that we medieval people would like you to know that we're always busy making technological advancement. And we are, you know, we are very, um, we are very excited by just how modern we are. <laughs> That's really fantastic. Uh, yeah. Kurt Whitaker, I can't thank you enough for joining us tonight. Um, I really appreciate you giving us these insights and constructing the PowerPoint 
and leading us through the conversation. I hope we have a chance to work again uh, together. Thanks, Cord. Thanks so much, Andy, and thanks uh, thanks to all of you who've joined us tonight. Um, you can, of course, always feel free to reach out to me. You can always find me uh, via the website at Wellesley or even just at cordwhitaker.com. And um, reach out to me. I'm always happy to discuss teaching and teaching and research. Fantastic. Thank you, Cord. Right. And, and I'd like to thank uh, all of our um, all of our attendees tonight for joining us for this fascinating webinar. Um, again, uh, you can follow the National Humanities Center on our social media feeds. We use Twitter quite a bit, as well as Facebook and Instagram to make announcements and to share with you uh, other activities and other initiatives that are coming up you can participate in. Um, that includes our next webinar, uh, which at the beginning of tonight's uh, session had two seats left. I'm not sure if they've been taken yet or not. On October the 10th, we'll work with Jason Sokol from the uh, University of New Hampshire uh, on a session titled, There Goes My Everything, White Southerners in the Age of Civil Rights, 1945 to 1975. Um, in just a moment, I'm going to open up the, actually I'm not, when you close the uh, room tonight, when I close the room, you'll get a survey and you'll be able to download your, uh, your certificate. Um, again, I, I very much appreciate you joining us. Uh, thank you for uh, essentially working after work. We hope to see you again at the next session, uh, the next webinar session of Humanities in Class webinar series. Thanks everyone, have a great day at school tomorrow. Good night.